Okay, we're going to go ahead and take a look at chapter 17, at least the introductory material, on just some uh, introductory comments on Pacific exploration and then transition a little bit to reasons and causes for the Europeans, particularly the Western Europeans, to be the ones to go ahead and dominate early transatlantic exploration and some of the impact that the Portuguese had on their early uh, adventures around. First of all, let's talk a little bit about um, non-European exploration and group of people that we've talked about previously. We've talked about the Polynesians. And the Polynesians, if you take a look here, uh, originating in Southeast Asia, they went everywhere. The Polynesians went uh, east and west, west as far as Madagascar, east as far as Easter Island, uh, northeast as far as Hawaii. And this is all incredibly impressive, especially when we remember the type of uh, canoes that they use in this travel. Remember that they had uh, no compass, no uh, very little, limit, very limited technology to get to these locations, guided by the stars, and yet they purposefully colonized almost every island in the Pacific. And so, you know, uh, we often talk about Chris Columbus and Zheng He, but these nameless Polynesian explorers were perhaps some of the greatest sailors of all time. If you look at uh, in the Pacific Ocean specifically, if you just look at the great distances between, for example, uh, the Cook Islands and Hawaii to the north, I mean, these are hundreds of miles, thousands of miles of ocean that the, uh, the Polynesians sailed, again, with the barest of tools at their disposal. The Polynesians, some people uh, have argued, may have even had some success in getting to the coast of South America, we're not really sure and not certain, but regardless, their influence is widespread. Think about Madagascar, uh, you know, Madagascar, an island that is just off the coast of Africa. And we see that because they settled there, that the ethnic, the biological impact they had on the island is still palatable today, that you still see it in the native population of Madagascar. These are the types of ships they took, and once you realize that they transported pigs and dogs and all their livestock and families enough to be able to have sustained civilization or sustained communities on these islands it's quite impressive uh, accomplishment for the polynesians to have done uh, madagascar again taking a look just off the coast of africa and you can see that you know you'd expect it to have mainly an african uh, uh, ethnic fingerprint however that's not the case here we have a picture of um, children from Madagascar, and you can see that uh, even though there is, you know, African influence, we see the Asian influences quite clear even in 2015. Now, um, the Indian Ocean comes up next. In fact, it says monsoons and down. Uh, or, or, I'm sorry, a uh, po uh, Malayo Polynesian. Make sure you write down that is spoken in Madagascar. It's a uh, language coming from the Polynesian people. Now, looking at uh, the Indian Ocean again, something that we're familiar with is Indian Ocean Trade Network. You might remember that the monsoon winds and dows, those are those ships that the Indian Ocean Trade Network utilized. We'll write down it helped international trade. This is not new information to us. We've talked about this before. Uh, that remember these alternating wind patterns allowed the Indian Ocean trade to be very safe, very quick, very predictable, something that especially Muslims participated in. And moreover, we see that there's these major cities along the east coast of Africa, cities that we'll come to call the Swahili city states. And that's primarily because these Swahili city states spoke Swahili. And Swahili is a great example of the influence that Muslims had in international trade because Swahili itself is a mix of Arabic and Bantu languages. Arabic brought from these Muslims incorporated into this African language and still a major language in East Africa to this day. Here in the green are the areas that we often refer to as the Swahili city-states from Kenya on down south. And they were a major, major trade hub in this eastern part of Africa. Uh, if you take a look at them stretching from Somalia on down to Mozambique, the um, Swahili city-states were uh, a place that are going to be a home for a lot of traders as they uh, gather these tropical African products. They're going to go ahead and move them to India, 
Muslims will settle all along the coast, and to this day, this eastern portion of Kenya, all of, virtually all of Somalia, a significant percentage of Tanzania, or Tan, uh, Tanzania, either way is an acceptable pronunciation, uh, remain Muslim to this day, these coastal regions. Now, going now to the Chinese, under the restored Ming and Zheng He, you might remember that the reason that this Muslim eunuch led a massive fleet of Chinese vessels throughout the Indian Ocean was not for exploration. Remember, it was not because they needed anything. It's because they wanted to do really one thing, to restore their prestige throughout the world. The voyages of Zheng He from the Ming took them all throughout Southeast Asia to the uh, Indian subcontinent to the Middle East and then again to that coast of Africa. And the reason why was that China had just spent some period of time conquered by the Mongols. And that's an embarrassing thing for the, uh, for the Chinese uh, culture that thought they were the best on the planet to be ruled by barbarians. And so for them, one of the key things they could do to show the world that they were back politically and militarily was for them to go ahead and to send these voyages around the world. The things that they did is they impressed the people that they encountered with their luxury products and goods, including the best porcelain in the world, as you can see some examples of uh, this porcelain here that would uh, show up in places as far as the east coast of Africa, as uh, Zheng He's uh, ships would get to Africa and other places, really wowing all the people that they found with the, um, the products and the size of the ships that Zheng He had with him. Zheng He and his voyagers brought back luxury products to the empire with them here. They have uh, zebras, they brought tusks, they brought all these different goods from as far away from Africa, and these animals survived. We have good records that they even uh, would live in the emperor's palatial grounds in China. And so quite a successful series of voyages Zheng He had undertaken. Here, a great example of what we call a treasure ship. This was Zheng He's largest ship compared to Chris Columbus's flagship. Images that we've seen before, but really a reminder. If, imagine if, what it would be like if you saw 50 of these treasure ships pull into your port in India, in Africa, in the Middle East, with an additional 200 more support ships. We believe that Zheng He's entire fleet had something like 30, 35,000 men that were a part of this. And so an overwhelming amount of men involved tens of thousands of individuals definitely the whole goal is to impress and they would have succeeded in every possible way now before we go ahead and go to astrolabe i do want to talk about the line that says uh, middle kingdom and priorities remember that the middle kingdom eventually decided to end those voyages of Zheng he and the reason they decided to end those voyages was that they had decided that they really are not uh, in a position financially to spend all this money basically sailing out to barbarians because China called themselves the Middle Kingdom. If anyone should be reaching out to anyone, let the barbarians come to us, thought many a Confucianist advisor and scholar. The Confucianists advised against these voyages and their voice was heard. Uh, the cost of defending the North from barbarians, other expenses were deemed more important and Zheng He's voyages came to an end and people had wondered what would have happened if those programs would have continued could they have reached to Europe what would it be like to see 50 treasure ships that size pull into a European port what if they had sailed east across the Pacific if the Polynesians could have uh, certainly China could have and what if along the west coast of the United States were 13 colonies not of European uh, support but of Chinese support how could history could have unfolded differently? Well, history will unfold in such a way that Europe will be the one doing this international trade and travel that will start colonies. And one of the things that will help them do that is the astrolabe, which is a piece of technology uh, under your handout, which is new technology that will help Europeans calculate latitude, which is really important to help you not get lost when you're deciding to cross vast oceans. And it also helps you to um, create accurate maps, which is also going to be a really important element to exploration. One more piece of new technology is the caravel. 
The caravel is a, actually a black bold lettered vocabulary word in this particular chapter. And uh, this is uh, one of the smaller European ships that we might laugh about with Chris Columbus. But the cool thing about the caravel is because of their small size, they were actually able to enter into very shallow waters and even sail up ships if need be. Very, di very, um, very um, good ships for exploration. And so not the largest ships, but able to do things that much larger ships like Zheng He's treasure ships would have been unable to do. So not, on, uh, not built to impress, but with a very practical purpose. Another uh, influence that's going to have a big impact is actually Christianity. Remember, if Christianity says it's like the only religion that can actually save a man's soul, there might be a religious desire to go to different parts of the world and share the Christian gospel message. But also, there's a negative side a bit to this with the Reconquista that we'll talk about in a little bit uh, further down the line with Europeans coming into religious conflict with non-Christians and how uh, this could even give them experience to uh, and confidence to do with non-Christians. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the Reformation. Uh, we've not yet talked about this, but this is an image of Martin Luther with the hammer nailing a famous essay he wrote up on the church walls in Wittenberg, Germany. Now, Martin Luther was a uh, Catholic monk who, though he was dedicated and devoted as a Catholic, he found himself coming more and more in conflict with certain teachings, not all, but certain teachings of the Catholic Church, particularly things he felt were not found in the Bible. And he started what's called the Protestant Reformation. And the key part of the word Protestant is the word protest, because that's certainly what he wanted to do to protest things he thought were corrupt or wrong or not grounded in the Bible. He wanted to reform. Uh, unfortunately, Martin Luther didn't reform the Catholic Church. He got kicked out of the Catholic Church. And because of this, we have the beginning of Protestants, Baptists, Methodists, Episcopalian, non-denominational Christ Christians, Presby uh, Assemblies of God, Pentecostals, all these people uh, have Martin Luther to thank for beginning the Reformation. This is what Europe looks like after the Reformation begins. In fact, if you look at the key, you can see the Protestants mainly dominated in Germany, England, Scotland, Netherlands, the northern part of Europe. And this actually, in a way, has a subtle way of inspiring exploration. Portugal and Spain, solidly Catholic. You might remember that the Spanish kicked out all non-Catholics out of Spain in 1492. Well, if Spain and Portugal are very devoutly Catholic, they see the Reformation as a very dangerous event and an event that can even encourage them to explore. You see, these Catholic nations felt inspired to spread the Catholic faith and to be the first ones to go to different parts of the world because they want to do so to defeat any potential Protestant growth in Africa in Asia, in America. If they could only get there first, Martin Luther's Protestant influence could stay where they wanted it to stay, to the confines of Northern Europe. So even this competition between religious groups has somewhat uh, something to do with the exploration that we'll see in this time period. Another thing that has to do with reasons why Spanish and Portuguese will want to explore has to do with the Italians. Take a look at this map, Italy, uh, right in the middle of the European peninsula, and it juts out into the Mediterranean Sea, almost bisecting the Mediterranean in half. And that wonderful position had set them up to be middlemen between Europeans and the Muslims and the Byzantine Empire to the east. And the Italians cherish that role as middlemen because if you are a middleman, what can you do to the price of the goods you get a hold of? You increase it, you raise it. And as the Italians from cities like Venice and Genoa sailed to the east and got silk and sugars and spices and brought it back to Europe for sale and distribution to European markets, you know what the, the Italians did? They increased the price. And they made quite a profit, such a profit, they were able to fund and to fuel 
the Italian Renaissance with all the art and all the churches and all the buildings funded by the immense profits from European hunger and desire for foreign luxury goods. If you're Spain and you're Portugal, you are geographically as far away from the Middle East as possible. You're as far west in the Mediterranean. There's no hope and no chance you could break the Italian dominance. In fact, remember what Italian, the Italians did to competitors in Constantinople, destroying it in a crusade. So the Spanish and Portuguese have a big motivation to find another way to get to the Middle East. They're not going to be able to make it through the Mediterranean. They can't compete with the Italians there, but they can do something better. The Italians and the, uh, the Spanish and the Portuguese can try to sail around Africa, if possible, and actually sail to those markets directly and forget about the Italian dominance and monopoly the trade that they see as a potential, that trade that fueled and funded the Renaissance in Italy is something that they want to be a part of. And the trade desire for them to get to Asia and Middle East will lead them to begin these explorations that we'll uh, know as so famous. Now, looking now at why did Western Europe dominate and not other parts? Well, what about Russia? Well, much of Russia, most of it's not even on the map here, but much of the Russian northern coast is frozen for much of the year. And so Russia struggles to have a warm water port. And this is going to be something we'll talk about for a long time for the rest of the semester. Russia desires a warm water port. If you look on this map where you see the Black Sea, the Black Sea was not controlled by Russia uh, originally. But it is something that they're going to desire to conquer and want to own and control. Why? The Black Sea will serve as a warm water port. The Black Sea connects to the Mediterranean Sea. That's their way out. And that will be a goal that Russia will have. But that's not going to be a goal that will be accomplished in the Middle Ages. In fact, in the 2014, 2013, 2015, in this time period when there's, if you look at the Black Sea, there's a peninsula that juts out in the middle of the peninsula. That's the Crimean Peninsula that was owned by Ukraine. And then you can understand why Russia invaded it and said, no, that's ours. We're just going to go ahead and take it over. Because without it, they don't have a foothold in the Black Sea. Whether it's in the Middle Ages or whether it's in the 1500s or the 1800s or the 1700s or 20, uh, the 2000s, Russia wants the Black Sea, and nothing has really changed. Now, because they don't have the Black Sea, because they don't have a northern coast that's not frozen, they're not going to be an initial player for exploration across the Atlantic. We'll take a look at the map. Look at France. Look at Spain. Look at Portugal. Look at the Netherlands. Look at England. What do they have in common? Well, they're all on the Atlantic Ocean. They're naturally poised. Their front door is the Atlantic Ocean. And so it makes sense that these are the nations that are going to be the ones that cross this sea that they wake up to every morning to see what's on the other side. One passing note about a fallen friend for some, the Byzantine Empire. Remember the Byzantine Empire, another name for the Eastern Roman Empire based in Constantinople? Well, the Byzantine Empire, great position if you want to be a land-based empire that is going to be a crossroads from Europe and Asia. Constantinople, a city that is right there in between of Europe and Asia. In fact, the modern version of Constantinople, Istanbul, is the only city in the world to be on two continents. That's great, unless you're interested in international sea-based trade. If you're interested in international sea-based trade, the Byzantine Empire is on the wrong side of the Mediterranean. They're as far away from the Atlantic Ocean as possible. And even if they weren't destroyed by the Turks, even if Constant uh, Constantinople didn't fall, they are not positioned geographically to be a competitor. And geography is not, is not always destiny. But in this case, it's really going to put them at a disadvantage. Now we're going to sneak one more group of people below the Byzantine Empire. We're going to put the Vikings in there and talk briefly about them. Uh, here, again, we just talked about why not Russia, uh, why France, why Spain, why Portugal, their position on the Atlantic, why the Byzantine Empire is not a player. They're on the wrong side of the Mediterranean. What about the Vikings? 
Well, the Vikings do some important early explorations, particularly in the North uh, Atlantic. And the reason they can do that about the year 1000, 500 years before Chris Columbus, is there was a, uh, an unusually warm period called the Medieval Warm Period. It was much warmer at this time. Climate change is a constant thing that has happened throughout world history and often has nothing to do with human activity. During the Medieval Warm Period, Places like Greenland were authentically green. The Vikings made it to North America. They settled areas like Vinland, which is in eastern Canada. That's great and that's wonderful until the climate changed again. And we entered what was called the Little Ice Age. It got so cold, Greenland was, in, uh, was not going to be able to be uh, uh, maintained by the Vikings. Not because it was impossible to live, but the Vikings of Greenland refused to adapt. You might remember the Inuits, the natives of Greenland, survived off the vast amounts of fish in the North Atlantic. But the Vikings of Greenland had uh, uh, created a taboo and refused to eat fish. And as a result, they died weakened in their very beds. While the Vikings of Iceland, with no taboo on fish consumption, did fine and remained. Greenland was abandoned. Canada was abandoned. And this is a good example that how we as societies can cause our own collapse if we refuse to adapt. That certainly is what happened to the Vikings of Greenland. But the reason why these Vikings don't get the credit that Chris Columbus does or the Portuguese do is they do not cause constant and continual contact between old and new worlds. They settle for a time, but when they leave Canada, they leave Canada. In fact, uh, they deconstructed most of their uh, uh, buildings and works and leave almost no archaeological fingerprint behind. And then the Vikings of Greenland literally die off, leaving only Iceland, which is really culturally more, uh, part of Europe. The Viking exploration, though impressive, with the longboat, this open-air boat that would take them from Europe to North America, even if it was for a relatively short time and even if it didn't cause constant interaction between the old and new world. Uh, well, le let's go to um, the role of the Iberian nations. Iberia is the peninsula that Spain and Portugal find themselves on, and where it says geography, we'll write down there as far southwest as possible in Europe. They're as far southwest as possible in Europe. They're on the Atlantic Ocean, but also look who else they're close to. They're as close to Africa as possible. In fact, take a closer look. Uh, when we'll uh, see just in a little bit um, the role that being next to Africa will play. But the Reconquista, on the handout where it says the confidence of Reconquista encouraged the Europeans to continue to push further. It encouraged them to push further. Remember that the Europeans had slowly begun to retake the Iberian Peninsula from the span from the uh, Muslims and this experience of fighting non-Europeans fighting uh, non-Christians and actually having victories told the Spanish you know what we can have success dealing with other cultures maybe we shouldn't be afraid to go beyond our borders and see what else there is here we have a diagram showing you the pushing of the the Muslims further south by south little by little ultimately leading to the final expulsion of all Jews and all Muslims in 1492 but that's what we mean by the confidence of the Reconquista encouraged them to to continue to look and on the handout where it says forget the Italians remember again they they don't want the Italians to be making money off them anymore they want to be the ones to take matters in their own hands and sail where no one has sailed before. Uh, Henry the Navigator, uh, we're going to write down under Portugal and West Africa, he is the individual who helped to fund much of the exploration of the coast of Africa. He doesn't do a lot of sailing himself, but he's going to put money up for map making, for explorations, for voyages to figure out what is going on on this west coast of Africa. Can we get around this thing? Is it something that is an obstacle that can be overcome? One of the experiences that the Portuguese have has to do with the city of Ceuta. And if you look there, Spain, look how close it is from Africa. If you ever go take a trip to Spain, you'll be able to take a ferry from the southern tip of Spain to 
the northern tip of Africa. It's a relatively short ferry ride. I've had the opportunity to go and to uh, be in Spain and go to Morocco for the day. And you basically get to go have lunch or dinner and come back before the day's over. It's a wonderful opportunity. Now, the interesting thing about Ceuta is that if you take a look, it's this little city on the northern tip of Africa. The box blows it up to the right, and you can see that much of it is like a red, uh, it's marked red, and it's a bit of a peninsula. But the cool thing about this city is that when you leave Spain to the north, and you take the ferry to Africa, and you step onto African soil, that city today in 2015 is actually a city in Spain. And so Spain actually owns part of Africa even to this day and that um, even though you can spend the whole day in Africa you've never left Spanish territory and the people in the city of 35,000 speak Spanish and their uh, majority of them are white Spaniards here in the city of Ceuta. Well one of the things we want to write down on our handout was that the city was conquered by the Europeans. It was a Muslim city originally conquered by the Europeans in 1415. And this North African Muslim city conquered by the Europeans in 1415, when the Europeans took it over and they saw the wealth that was there, the gold that was there, and they realized that compared to how they were living back in Europe, the Muslims had it really well. And the question the Europeans had, where did they get all the gold? Where did they get these wealth? Where did they get these resources? And how can we obtain it? And this conquest of Ceuta helped the Europeans realize this gold's coming from somewhere. Perhaps we should sail farther south along the coast of Africa and see what we can discover. And so this city, which will become, which is part of Spain to this day, a remnant of colonial conquest and expansion, is going to be a city that will inspire the Europeans that keep sailing. What do they find when they keep sailing? Well, here's a map of Europe, and the southwestern part of this map is a green circle with an island. Here in this green circle with an island is the city, the, the, the island of Madeira. Now, this island shows up in medieval maps as early as 1339, but the Portuguese don't settle it to 1425. And this is like a practice run of colonization. They find an island, there's nothing on it, its relatively warm climate allows them to grow things on it that they want, like sugarcane. The cool thing is that, remember, sugar was something that the Europeans didn't have. They had to get it from the Middle East. And here, it's warm enough to grow sugarcane in the South Atl in the Atlantic off the coast of Africa. And so they can even start uh, producing the things that they had always desired and always wanted. Here is a picture. Uh, this is Portuguese territory today of Madeira. I believe it's Port It's either Portuguese or Spanish territory. I, I forget. But regardless, really beautiful and a tourist destination to this day. Uh, and you can see why. Here, let's look at another island, this time circled as far west on the map as it can go in red. Islands that the Portuguese discovered called the Azores. And uh, these are uh, islands that were colonized. Again, islands that were empty, but islands that would not be empty for long. The great thing about these islands is, again, there could be uh, places that you could raise agricultural settlements and places that could serve as uh, rest stops for any voyages further west. Another islands, the Canary Islands, discovered off the coast of Africa, are so close to Africa that on a clear day from the Canary Islands, you can see Africa, and from a clear day from the African coast, you can see the Canary Islands. The big difference is that these islands are the only islands that they discover that are inhabited by natives. These natives came from Africa. DNA testing suggests that they're actually Berbers, which are a tribal group from North Africa, that settled the Canary Islands about the year 1000. And in the year 1402, Europeans come in contact and actually conquer them. They enslave and use them to grow Sugarcane, again, this Canary Island experience is a colonialism with training wheels. It gives them, what I mean by that is it gives the, the um, Europeans an opportunity to see what it's like to beat up non-European people, an opportunity to see what it's like to set up colonies, to conquer land that's not your own, and then subjugate them into obedience and servitude. If you look at 
the Canary Islands, beautiful islands as well, lush, green, wonderful place for growing uh, um, different agricultural products, and also a place of massive cannons and ravines, and we'll actually look in class time about how the geography causes a very interesting way to develop to uh, communicate Spanish long distances. Here's an image of the Caravel, the aforementioned ship that would be an advantage to European exploration at the time. Uh, a couple of people that we need to know by name, we need to know Vasco da Gama. He's the first European to sail around the tip, uh, to get to the tip of Africa. This is really important because no European knew for sure if you could actually get around Africa. They didn't know if it went all the way to Antarctica. And so when Vasco da Gama sails around the uh, tip of, of Africa, this is a wonderful thing. In 1488, it means that Europeans can get to India or China by sailing there directly, something that they didn't know it w for sure could be done. Um, if Dias does, uh, uh, so the Cape of Good Hope is Dias, D-I-A-S, who does the southern tip of Africa. Vasco da Gama is the one who actually rounds the tip of South Africa and gets to India, the first European to sail to India. If you look, look how, what happens when he sails along the southern tip of South Africa, look how he kind of hugs the coast and kind of isn't sure where he's going. And notice what happens when he gets to Mombasa and Malindi. All of a sudden, he confidently sails hundreds of miles of ocean, open sea that he's never been before to India. What do you think happened? Remember, those are the Swahili city-states who has been using the monsoon winds for hundreds of years. Muslims have been using it for hundreds of years. People in the Indian Ocean have been sailing confidently using the monsoon winds. Likely, the beginning of the voyage shows he doesn't know what, what's going on. He doesn't know where he's going, what it's like, but once he gets to the Swahili city-states, he encounters people that can, he encounters people that can take him across the Indian Ocean. They do, and he gets to the destination that every European had desired and dreamed of. Now, what happens when he gets there? Well, they had brought a couple of different uh, items to uh, show the Indians that would be their hosts. And this is a slide. The Portuguese brought items with them to trade. But fortunately, the items that they trade were not what the Indians thought were very impressive. One list that demonstrates what the uh, Portuguese brought to trade with the Indians were the following. They brought with them four cloaks of scarlet cloth, six hats, four branches of corals, a box of seven brass vessels, a chest of sugar, two barrels of oil, and a cask of honey. It, that isn't something that you bring on an international trip to wow the people that you're coming in contact with. That's stuff that you like finding your garage for a garage sale on a weekend trying to make a few bucks. As you can imagine, the Indian leaders that met these strange white individuals from across the sea laughed at the products that they brought in, really couldn't even believe that the Europeans were serious, that they wanted to trade like this, you know, these basically leftovers that you give to a goodwill and expect to have some sort of deal. Fortunately, the Portuguese brought gold and in international currency, and they were able to return to Portugal with, uh, uh, with goods that were valued at 60 times the entire cost of the expedition. In other words, when you include all the costs of the exploration, paid all the sailors' wages, uh, everything that it took to get to India and back, they made 60 times more than it cost, an incredible profit. And it just made the Portuguese wonder, what if we actually brought decent things to trade? What could we do if we didn't bring honey and try to like buy things with that? So this is a wonderful success. Now, unfortunately, Vasco, uh, Vasco da Gama decides to ignore the advice of the Indians and decides not to wait for the monsoon to change and not to have that quick ride back to Africa and home. The trip from Africa to India or India to Africa during a monsoon wind should only take about 23 days. But because he ignored the advice of the Indians who, who had been doing this for hundreds of years, what should have been a 23-day trip if he had waited took Vasco da Gama 123 days. 
Needless, needless to say, he was not prepared for that. Half of his crew died, and they would limp back to Europe, barely making it. Now, one final person we need to talk about is Cabral. Cabral is uh, voyages are demonstrated. Uh, the one we need to look at in um, red. One of the things that Europeans would do as they try to sail around Africa is they would purposely kind of sail out into the South Atlantic to try to hook around Europe, uh, or hook around Africa, rather. And unfortunately for Cabral, he did that, but went a little bit too far, and in hooking out into the South Atlantic, actually ended up somewhere he didn't expect, Brazil. And as he got to Brazil, he claimed the land that he bumped into and said, I don't know where I am, but wherever I am, this is now property of Portugal, which is why to this day, uh, Brazil is a Portuguese speaking uh, locale. And in fact, more people speak Portuguese in Brazil than in Portugal itself. This concludes our introduction to our exploration will go ahead in class continue with talking about the Spanish attempts and the interactions with Africa and the Americas.